on World News Tonight. New warnings. Russia retaliates against NATO amid more talks to defuse tensions on the chaos in Ukraine. With no avail on finding common ground, tonight the updates on the tense talks. Resignation pressure. Boris Johnson on the verge of irreparable damage to his leadership as calls to step down erupt within the parliament. Backlash from the entire country continues to pour in. Unvax tax. Quebec mulls new plans to protect against the spread of COVID-19. New measures even resorting to unconventional financial needs. The public remains unsure of the repercussions to come. And land of snow. Known to many as a harsh climate, the sand dunes of Saudi Arabia get a makeover by Mother Nature, leaving a land of dust looking like a winter wonderland. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with tense talks. NATO said it was willing to talk to Russia about arms control and missile deployments to avert the risk of war in Europe. But Moscow said the situation was very dangerous and the way forward was unclear. We have made it clear and we told the Russians directly again today that if Russia further invades Ukraine, there will be significant costs and consequences. The gulf between the United States and Russia appeared as stark as ever Wednesday following a four-hour NATO meeting in Brussels, where U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman reiterated a warning to Russia over its massing of troops near Ukraine and wondered why the nuclear-armed nation claimed it felt threatened by its much smaller neighbor. They are a powerful country. The fact that they feel threatened by Ukraine, a smaller and still developing democracy, is hard to understand, quite frankly. Why they need 100,000 troops on the border, which they say are not for invasion, but are for exercising. When live fire exercises are reported this morning, uh, what is this about? Is this about invasion? Is this about intimidation? Is this about uh, trying to uh, be subversive? I don't know, but it is not conducive to getting to diplomatic solutions. NATO said it was willing to talk to Russia about arms control and missile deployments to avert the risk of war in Europe, but would not allow Moscow to veto Ukraine's ambition to join NATO one day. At a lengthy news conference, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Alexander Krushko said Russia could not take seriously NATO's claim to be a defensive alliance that posed no threat to Russia. We have honestly, explicitly, and without trying to cut corners using the politically correct forms, pointed out that further deterioration in ties could lead to unpredictable and severe consequences for European security. Russia disagrees with such a scenario. Afterward, Krushko said Moscow would use military means to neutralize security threats if diplomacy proved insufficient. The talks were set to continue on Thursday in Vienna. Prime Minister Boris Johnson apologized for attending a garden party during Britain's first coronavirus lockdown, but brushed aside opposition demands that he resign for breaching the rules his own government had imposed on the nation. Mr. Speaker, I want to apologize. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has apologised to Parliament on Wednesday for a bring-your-own-boost gathering that was held at his official residence during the country's first lockdown. Uh, I, 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 regret, I regret very much, I regret very much that we did not do things differently. This was the first time he admitted he had attended the party at 10 Downing Street on 20th of May 2020 when COVID-19 rules limited social gatherings to the bare minimum. And when I went into that garden just after six on the 20th of May 2020 to thank groups of staff before going back into my office 25 minutes later to continue working, I believed implicitly that this was a work event. I know that millions of people across this country have made extraordinary sacrifices over the last 18 months, and I know the rage they feel with me and with the government I lead when they think that in Downing Street itself the rules 
are not being properly followed by the people who make the rules. Opposition Labour Party leader Keir Starmer said Johnson must now resign. After months of deceit and deception, the pathetic spectacle of a man who's run out of road. His defence, his defence that he didn't realise he was at a party. <laughs> it, it, it is so ridiculous that it's actually offensive to the British public. He was hosting boozy parties in Downing Street. Yes. Is he now going to do the decent thing and resign? Uh, Mr. Speaker. In response, the Prime Minister deferred to an internal investigation into other allegations that he and his officials held rule-breaking parties. And that I wish things had been done differently. Two snap polls on Tuesday showed well over half of the respondents thought Johnson should resign. There are also mutterings that Conservative lawmakers, who can trigger a leadership challenge in Parliament, are sharpening their knives. Now on to the scandal with the world's number one tennis player. Novak Djokovic has been drawn to play in the Australian Open despite ongoing uncertainty over whether his visa may be cancelled again by the government. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Pramukh Nugera, reporting from Canberra in Australia. Pramukh? Yes, Anuradhi. The world number one men's player was included in the draw after an initial delay. A spokesman for Immigration Minister had said he is still considering using his powers to revoke Djokovic's visa. Djokovic was barred entry last week due to lack of vaccination. Following the verdict, though, Australia's immigration minister said he was still considering cancelling the tennis star's visa on other grounds. With his actions under heavy scrutiny, Djokovic admitted that he had also broken COVID isolation rules in Serbia after meeting up with people when he knew he was positive. He admitted he had also made errors on his travel form into Australia. A false declaration on his travel form is grounds for visa cancellation. Djokovic said his agent had prepared the paperwork and made an administrative mistake in ticking a box saying he hadn't travelled anywhere 14 days prior to entering Australia. Prime Minister Scott Morrison declined to say when a decision might come from his government, quashing press gallery reports that a decision would be made imminently. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than the world news special correspondent Pramukh Nugera from Canberra in Australia. In response to North Korea's latest ballistic missile tests, the Biden administration has blacklisted six North Korean individuals for engaging in the development of the regime's weapons programs. The U.S. is imposing sanctions on North Korea in response to the regime's latest ballistic missile tests. The Treasury Department said Wednesday that it's designating five North Korean individuals for their work in the development of weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile-related programs for the regime. It explained that one is based in Russia while the others are in China. The statement stressed that measures are in line with the Biden administration's efforts to prevent the advancement of Pyongyang's WMD and ballistic missile programs. It adds they also come as the regime has carried out six ballistic missile launches since September 2021, violating multiple UN Security Council resolutions. The State Department has also designated an additional North Korean individual based in Russia, along with a Russian entity for a similar reason. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said the sanctions are aimed at constraining the North's weapons programs. The sanctions freeze any U.S.-related assets of those targeted and prohibit all dealings with them. These are the Biden administration's first sanctions to specifically target Pyongyang's weapons programs. However, the U.S. says it still wants to hold talks with the North and persuade it to give up its nuclear and missiles programs. Prince Andrew is to face a civil case in the United States over allegations the sexually assaulted a woman when she was 17. Virginia Jeffrey is suing the prince, claiming he abused her in 2001. In a legal setback for Britain's Prince Andrew, a Manhattan judge rejected the prince's bid to dismiss a lawsuit accusing him of sexually abusing a 17-year-old girl roughly two decades ago. In a decision made public on Wednesday, the judge said that Virginia Giuffre could pursue her civil suit against Andrew 
in which she claims he battered her and intentionally caused her emotional distress while she was allegedly being trafficked for sexual purposes by late financier Jeffrey Epstein. The judge said it was premature to assess Andrew's efforts to cast doubt on her claims, though the 61-year-old prince could do so at a trial. In 2009, Epstein paid Jouffre $500,000 without admitting liability to end a separate lawsuit charging him of sexually abusing her while underage. The judge in Andrew's case said it was too soon to decide whether that settlement with Epstein clearly and unambiguously shielded Andrew from also being sued by Jouffre. The judge did not address the merits of Jouffre's claims. Lawyers for Andrew and Jouffre did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Andrew, the second son of Queen Elizabeth, has denied Jouffre's accusations that he forced her to have sex more than two decades ago at a London home of former Epstein associate Gillen Maxwell and abused her at two Epstein properties. Maxwell was convicted on December 29th of recruiting and grooming girls for Epstein to abuse between 1994 and 2004. While the claims against Andrew have not been proven and the prince is not accused of criminal wrongdoing, his ties to Epstein have damaged his reputation and cost him many royal duties. The judge's decision to keep Jouffre's case against Andrew on track means that a trial could begin in the fall if no settlement is reached beforehand. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Omicron is slamming the world hard right now, with almost all continents seeing huge surges in new cases. According to the World Health Organization, the tally from last week was an all-time high. Countries like the US and UK continue to struggle, while Israel decided that lockdown won't protect its citizens against the new train. Last week's global COVID-19 tally topped 15 million, the highest recorded weekly tally so far. This according to the World Health Organization on Wednesday for the week ending January 9th. This is also a jump of 55% from the week before. Despite the sharp rise in cases, the death toll only rose by 3% as Omicron poses less threat to patients' health. Let's be clear. While Omicron causes less severe disease than Delta, it remains a dangerous virus, particularly for those who are unvaccinated. Almost 50,000 deaths a week is 50,000 deaths too many. Learning to live with this virus does not mean we can or should accept this number of deaths. France came in second on the list, followed by UK, then Italy. While fewer cases, Germany also hit a record high for the daily tally with more than 80,000. The country's parliament is now pushing for a vaccine mandate as it assumes infections will only speed up. But I believe it's necessary and I will repeat what I've just said. The decision not to get vaccinated is not just a decision for oneself, but for 80 million other people and we're seeing this in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Another country hit harshly by Omicron was Israel, and with domestic transmission surging and Prime Minister Naftali Bennett forecasting between 2 million and 4 million infections in the weeks ahead, the country concluded that travel restrictions would do little other than harm the economy. Bennett said Tuesday that Israel is following three guiding principles, keep our economy open, protect the most vulnerable folks in society, the elders, and to take care of our children. Different nations are taking various measures to get people vaccinated and reduce the risk of spreading the virus. The Canadian province of Quebec, struggling to control the Omicron variant, will impose a new health tax in the coming weeks on those who are not vaccinated against COVID-19. Adults in Canada's second most populous province, Quebec, will be enforcing a health tax on people who refuse to get the coronavirus vaccine. The provincial government announced Tuesday... The Premier said that the 10% of Quebec residents who have not received any doses must not harm the 90% who have. The vaccine is the key to fight the virus. This is why we're looking uh, for a an health contribution for adults who refuse to be vaccinated for non-medical reasons. 
those who refuse to receive their first dose in the coming weeks will have to pay a new health contribution. He added that the measure is a consequence of unvaccinated people putting what he called a burden on the health service, with the 10% unvaccinated accounting for around 50% of people in intensive care units. The Novax pay tax policy will not apply to people who cannot take the jab for medical reasons. And the provincial finance ministry said the amount would not be less than 100 Canadian dollars. Unvaccinated people are already banned from non-essential stores in Quebec, including shops selling alcohol and cannabis. Quebec remains one of the worst-hit Canadian provinces for new coronavirus infections, as the country struggles to contain the Omicron variant. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced Monday that his government had enough doses for all eligible Canadians to receive a booster and a fourth dose. The country's death toll from COVID-19 surpassed 12,000 as of Tuesday. The U.S. is seeing a surge in COVID cases yet again and is not willing to close schools whatsoever. The Biden administration is taking additional measures by sending more testing kits for the children. With the aim of keeping schools open as the Omicron variant spreads rapidly across the country, the Biden administration on Wednesday announced it will send U.S. schools millions more COVID-19 tests. White House COVID-19 response coordinator Jeffrey Zients. So today we're taking additional actions, including sending 5 million free rapid tests to schools each month, and providing another 5 million lab-based tests each month. The new measures are on top of $10 billion in resources already sent to states for testing in schools, which the White House says have resulted in 96 percent of schools being open this month, which now includes Chicago public schools. Students in Chicago returned to in-person classes after teachers reached an agreement on COVID safeguards, including wider testing. The Biden administration's test-to-stay strategy aims to allow schools to use frequent testing to keep students in class after exposure to someone with COVID-19 instead of quarantining at home. That strategy, according to the CDC, as well as vaccination, masking and ventilation, will help keep school doors open and kids in class. U.S. consumer prices increased solidly, culminating the largest annual rise in inflation in nearly four decades. Small business owners and shoppers in a Washington, D.C. neighborhood said they were struggling to adjust to rising prices. American consumers got hit with the biggest price increases in nearly 40 years. The Labor Department reported Wednesday the consumer price index surged 7 percent in the year through December. That's well above the Federal Reserve's target. Supply chain snags caused by the health crisis and budding wage pressures are pushing up inflation, driving the index higher, escalating rents and used car and truck prices. The rapid rise of inflation is bolstering expectations that the Fed will begin raising interest rates as early as March. Fed Chair Jerome Powell told lawmakers on Tuesday that the economy no longer needs accommodative policies such as low interest rates. We are strongly committed to achieving our statutory goals of maximum employment and price stability. We will use our tools to support the economy and a strong labor market and to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched. The price index was in line with economists' forecasts, so Wall Street took the data in stride, driving stocks higher in early trading Wednesday. Economists believe the year-on-year -year consumer inflation rate probably peaked in December, but the health crisis could slow progress towards a normalization of supply chains just as they started showing signs of easing. Several people were killed as a huge blast went off on a road near the main international airport in the Somali capital. The Al-Shabaab extremist group has claimed responsibility. <laughs> Several people were killed in Somalia's capital on Wednesday when a car bomb exploded on a road leading to the airport. Mogadishu resident Mohamed Osman was praying nearby and said the shock of the blast hit the walls and roof of his mosque. When outside, he saw destroyed cars, some collapsed houses and body parts in the street. Osman said he had seen nine bodies at the scene. Abdi Qadir Abdi Rahman, director of the Armin Ambulance Service, put the death toll at eight. It was not immediately clear who was responsible, though such attacks have in the past been claimed by the Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab. 
It aims to overthrow Somalia's central government and impose a strict interpretation of Islamic law. The group carries out frequent gun and bomb attacks on security and government targets, as well as civilians. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Rachel Balkovec has made baseball history again. As the first female manager for a minor league baseball team for Yankees affiliate, the Tampa Tarpons. Back in 2020, she first made history as the first female hitting coach in minor league baseball. North Carolina saw its black community take to the streets to express their outrage against the most recent shooting of a black man by a white police officer. The off-duty police officer claims he was acting in self-defense. Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter is fighting the same fight that saw her father's entire life being dedicated to. Voting rights and the equality expected to be upheld in its exercise is once again under threat and Dr. Bernice King is ready to continue in her father's footsteps. South Korea has taken delivery of its first batch of COVID-19 pills from Pfizer. They'll be administered with priority for the elderly people and people with weakened immune systems. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight with some rare visuals of a sand dune in Saudi Arabia that turned white in a sheet of snow. Thank you for joining us. Good night.